Kristen Henley can be with us tonight. She's a graduate from Loma Linda University, I guess postgraduate school, and she got an MS degree, a Master of Science degree in uh, marriage and family therapy. And she's also a licensed marriage and family therapist. And I'll let her tell more about her, uh, her work history, but I will <coughs> say that she worked from 2008 full-time until about 2014. And over the last two years, she's been more of a full-time mom with some contract work intermittently. And so welcome, Kristen. I'll let you proceed with your topic. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. All right. So as Dr. Hardin mentioned, um, the last couple of years I've been more of a full-time mom. I have a two-year-old and a 10-month-old at home that keep me very busy. Um, and so tonight we're going to talk about anxiety, depression, and advantages of cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. Has anybody heard of cognitive behavioral therapy before? Okay, so it's pretty self-explanatory. Cognitive, our cognitions, our thoughts. Um, in this type of therapy that when we work with people using this type of therapy, we're looking at their cognitions and their thoughts and we're seeing how they impact our emotions and therefore our behaviors. So um, within the last two years I have done, and before I had children, I got involved in working with Dr. Neil Nedley um, he's based out of Weimar. His um, practice was in Oklahoma, and they recently moved. Um, he, his, his name is uh, the Nedley Health Institute, which they recently moved out to Weimar. And specifically, he has a residential depression and anxiety recovery program. Um, and the next one is actually going to be January 12 to 23. They just had one. It's a very intensive 10-day program. Most people go who are suffering anywhere from mild depression to severe depression um, or, or anxiety as well. Typically those go hand in hand. And it's a holistic program where we look at nutrition, um, exercise, light therapy. There's a spiritual counselor on board and there's also a cognitive behavioral therapist uh, which is the piece I do when I go work for him. He has about four or five programs a year. And it's an excellent program. You do have that this information on your handout if you want to look online, Depression the Way Out. Um, there's also an emotional intelligence summit that he does, which is more of a weekend for professionals. You can go and get continuing education. Um, but late lay people can go as well and um, this one's February 16 through the 20th and there's a theme typically he has presenters come in um, to do different lectures and this year is on neuroplasticity so you can also go online and um, look if you have any questions kind of look into that so um, I'm going to be using some of his information during these programs we use two specific books in the therapy um, there's SOS, Help for Your Emotions, this is also on your paper, and uh, Telling Yourself the Truth. These are excellent reads. Has anybody seen these before? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a lot of what I'm going to lecture on comes from these books, as well as his book, The Lost Art of Thinking. This book, he's written uh, several different books, Depression the Way Out, Proof Positive. This one specifically, he um, is educating people on how to improve emotional intelligence. So um, this is really important, especially in the times that we live in. A lot of us are, and I'm going to talk about the brain in a minute, but a lot of us um, think it's really important to, to have IQ, which, right, that's important, but in order to have a successful, healthy life, it's actually just as important to work on your EQ, your emotional intelligence, and there's things that you can do in your lifestyle um, and using cognitive behavioral therapy to enhance your emotional intelligence. So another great book. All right, so quickly I just want to review um, this. We're going to talk about diagnoses, and this comes from the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, which is basically the textbook for psychiatrists, therapists, psychologists to help diagnose people. And I don't want to spend a whole lot of time in this, one, because we don't want to all leave here thinking we have 
<laughs> 12 of these different disorders, but, um, but mainly because I want to get to the meat of the presentation, which is talking about prevention. Um, but you can see there's many different types of depression, and the common feature is presence of sadness, um, emptiness, irritable mood, um, and typically there's some somatic and cognitive changes that are going to impact the person's functioning, okay? And then the, the reason they're different is because of the duration, so how long it lasts, the timing of it, and the etiology of them. Um, bipolar disorders, so there's type 1 and type 2 bipolar, and um, type 1 is actually worse than type 2 because it's a, there's more of a severe depression that swings into um, mania. So it, and it could be mild forms of depression with brief mania to severe depression with rapid cycling mania. And what is mania? Um, just down here, the manic episodes, there's some symptoms of uh, grandiosity. So you may think you don't need a whole lot of sleep if you're struggling with this dis disorder. There's increased talkativeness, racing of thoughts, distractibility. Typically there's risky behavior involved. Um, and so in bipolar disorders, you're swinging from depression to mania. Um, type 2 is less severe and typically there's less impairment. So you may not be hospitalized or you may not have psychotic features. Um, so you'll see that people like swinging from, does that make sense? People swing from depression to these um, episodes of, uh, it's almost like a hyperness in a sense. Okay, and then, um, oh, I put scissors on, that's interesting. <laughs> um, it changed my slide just a little bit, but I, the main stuff is there. So types of anxiety disorders, um, there's a whole bunch Again, I don't want to get too deep into these, but there's social anxiety disorder, panic attack. Anybody hear about panic attacks? Maybe you know somebody who has struggled or is struggling with um, episodes of panic attacks. Generalized anxiety disorder is also a common one. And in all of these types of anxiety disorders, there's muscle tension, and people are mainly hypervigilant, so they're afraid of the future. They're preparing for some sort of danger that potentially could happen in the future. They also tend to be more cautious and some may even avoid certain behaviors like going out in public for fear of being around too many people and feeling stuck. And then obsessive compulsive disorders. This is also, you see anxiety in this as well. Um, and typically there's a pattern of unreasonable thoughts and fears, which are the obsessions that lead you to repetitive behaviors, which are the compulsions. And then the obsessions and the compulsions, they interfere with daily activities and cause significant distress. So we use some of these terms very loosely. I sometimes joke about how, how I tend to be OCD. Um, you know, I check my doors at night, especially when my husband's you know, not home, he's gonna be um, working late or something. I know I locked the door, but I just wanna make sure, just in case anybody, if I had a, a mommy moment or whatever. And so we joke about having, you know, some sort of obsessions, but the difference with this is it has to cause a significant distress. So it has to be um, a problem enough for you to, to impair your daily functioning. And then there's trauma and stress-related disorders that we'll see a lot of anxiety and depression as well. It's reactive attachment disorder, which typically we see in children in the foster care system that have been passed around. They have a trauma that, that has happened to them, and they get passed around from home to home. Post-traumatic stress disorder, we hear this one a lot too. This is acute distress disorder is very similar, but it happens typically right after the trauma and doesn't last as long. It can last up to three months or so versus post-traumatic stress disorder can last for years. Um, and these disorders, a psychiatrist or a counselor um, would give this diagnosis because the trauma or the stressful event is a diagnostic criteria. So that's specific. So um, jumping into the causes of depression and anxiety. So 
there's numerous reasons why people struggle with depression and anxiety. There's about 16 million Americans a year struggling with depression, anxiety, or both, um, which is, I think they say nearly one in three Americans are struggling with this. So this is a, a very big problem, and we often ask, well, why? How? How is? How did it come about? And um, Dr. Nedley, actually, I pulled this from his Depression the Way Out online um, on his website. He says that most causes typically fall into these 10 categories. Um, so, sorry, I'm going to go back. I'll, I'll flip back and forth. I'll let you take the picture, though. So there's 10 categories. And he says that even though you might have several within one category, each category, he calls them hits. And he says that typically in order to have a significant mental health um, impairment in your life, you have to have at least four, okay? So you can see there's genetics, so a family history, there's de a developmental hit, there could be hormonal issues or, or home life issues, lifestyle, so not getting enough exercise or daylight or fresh air, circadian rhythm, which is your sleep patterns, so some people are getting too much sleep, some aren't getting enough sleep. Um, nutrition, so are you, do you have appropriate nutrients in your system? Um, or do you have high toxic levels like mercury or lead levels? Um, addictions, people are struggling with alcohol or tobacco, caffeine or drugs. Um, social, so absence of a social support or stressful events, and I think you could even put grief under this section, so that would be a hit. Um, medical issues, and then frontal lobe, which we're going to talk about, some of you are maybe wondering what the frontal lobe is, but um, in this area you might be struggling with a low carbohydrate diet, possibly eating too, many, uh, too much meat or um, have high cheese diet, having certain addictions like internet, pornography, um, entertainment, there's even some music. All this comes out of this oh, out of this book here, The Lost Art of Thinking. He talks extensively about this. So again, this is a really good resource. And I actually forgot to put this book on your handout. So if you have any questions after, you can take a look at it. Um, so just as these, and I'll give you examples. So a mom possibly struggling with postpartum depression um, she might have, what, what kind of hits would she have? Maybe just looking at this list here. Lifestyle, Lifestyle right? Yeah. So not getting enough exercise. She probably has this one. Yes. This is one I need to watch out for still, my 10 month old, uh, who still wakes me up two to three times a night. So the sure. circadian rhythm hit. Dr. Nedley actually talks extensively about this, that this is the number one hit for women who are struggling with postpartum depression. So she might have that. She has some hormonal um, hits as well, maybe nutrition, and definitely social, not being able to get out as frequently or as much as she would like to. So that just gives you an example. So just as we see these hits that can affect you, these are also areas that we can work on to uh, reduce your depression or anxiety. Okay, so frontal lobe. Let's talk about this. So as we start talking about prevention and what happens with our thoughts and how it impacts our emotions and our behaviors, I really like to um, talk about the brain and what's happening in our brain. I'm not a brain scientist at all, so um, please don't, I hope I can explain this the best way possible. Uh, but basically, and we're going to see a video, if you, if you don't mind bringing that video up, yeah. Um, so the amygdala is in the center of our brain, and um, yeah, yeah. Um, that's where our emotions fire off in our brain. And then we have our frontal lobe. What, what do we know about our prefrontal cortex, which is in our frontal lobe? Has anybody heard of the functioning of that? Decision-making. Decision-making. So that's where our, we have logical thoughts, where we can decide, decipher what's wrong, the difference between right and wrong, and rational versus irrational thoughts. And Daniel Siegel's going to use, if you 
guys are visual and if you really want to remember this, he's going to use this hand model as the brain. And I'm starting it a little bit late, but basically just to catch you up, he's saying that this is your brain stem. If you all want to do this, this is your brain stem. And if you fold your thumb over, this is your limbic system. And this is the, where your emotions are firing off. I'll let him explain it because he's a little bit better. This limbic area and brainstem area, they work together. And because these are below the next area of the brain, the cortex, we call them subcortical. A lot of our impulses, our automatic behaviors, our just innate, learned reactions to things, our instincts, are driven by these subcortical areas, including information that comes up from the body itself. Your heart pounding, your intestines churning, feed up to the limbic area of the brainstem and get you all ripped up. So that's kind of a loop that creates what we call our emotional state. The cortex developed when we became mammals also, as the limbic area did, but the front part of this cortex, from your second to last knuckles down, your fingernails, the front part developed when we became primates, and this part where your fingernails are is called the prefrontal cortex because it's the frontmost part, the frontal lobe. This is the part that's most developed in humans. And it's this part that gives us the ability to pause before acting on an impulse. And the way it works is there are fibers that come down from this middle prefrontal area that actually calm down the irritable limbic area or brainstem area. Literally, this prefrontal region regulates the lower subcortical limbic brainstem and even bodily areas. So, in many ways, what we think happens is Mindful awareness practice creates a state of activation in that moment that in a way harnesses the power of this prefrontal area in that moment. As you repeatedly practice something, that state can become a trait because neurons which are firing together, wired together. So with the strengthening of this prefrontal area, what happens is, for example, if a child is angry, and the brainstem is activating a fight response. The limbic area works with that to develop a feeling of fear. There's a sense of betrayal by what happens when you're really angry, you're burning up, your heart is pounding, and everything is going to get you to fight, to get a knife, to get a gun, to hit someone, to do something really violent. But your prefrontal cortex, as you pause, and the very parts of the brain that allow you to pause are also the same part of the brain, this middle prefrontal area, that allows you to have insight into what's going on. My heart's pounding, I'm really angry. Empathy for someone else. Maybe that guy didn't mean it, or maybe he's doing the best he can. And then even a sense of morality. So when we develop the middle prefrontal areas, we actually can not only pause, but we can think of the larger social good and enact a behavior that's better for everyone. And that's where mindfulness really alters things like bullying, like violent acts of aggression. And it's where mindfulness can change the world, literally one person, one relationship at a time. Okay, so I forgot to explain who he was. Um, Dr. Daniel Siegel works a lot um, with brain science. He works at UCLA in the School of Medicine. Um, he's a psychiatrist. And, um, just click through again. Okay. So, and, um, he alludes to, um, evolution, and I actually don't believe in that. I believe in a God that created, um, our brain and to, to work this way and to function. So, and when he talks about mindfulness, um, he really is just, we want to slow our emotions down. And if there's one thing that you walk away from this presentation, it's that our thoughts are very powerful. And our thoughts, we can control our emotions. So we might not be able to control the initial emotion, but our prefrontal cortex, and as we work to strengthen that part of our brain, it can really, um, we can be thinking 
rational and accurate thoughts that can therefore help us to reduce our depression and anxiety and to have um, more healthy behaviors. Okay, Proverbs 23, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And Marcus Aurelius from history, you have the power over your mind, not outside events. Realize this and you will find strength. Oh, no, one of my quotes here didn't show up. We'll keep going and uh, this is another really important um, I'm just going to pull it up on my computer. So let me ask you this while I do that. Um, this little sweet girl, this she's saying, you made me mad. What could be wrong about this phrase? She's she, she reacted. She reacted, so she chose to be mad. Somebody else? She's blaming the other. So blaming it's the other. Their it's all their fault. OK. Can, can somebody make us mad? No. Okay. Wow, you guys are making this their easy. What was that? Their action can disturb us. Right? Yes, their action can disturb us. So, um, the, I've got this little character here. He's trying to be flexible, but his boss is criticizing, giving him some constructive criticism. I appreciate the effort, but I need you to be more flexible. Okay, so using this example, um, we are going to take a look at this inaccurate view of emotions. So they're saying that A, the activating event, causes my emotion and behavior. So for example, if you're criticized your, for, by your boss, that makes you angry and anxious and depressed. Now, what you guys said, um, so it can, what word did you use? Uh, start with an A. You said it, it, it could disturb you. Disturb you, that's right. Yeah. Okay, so it can yeah. disturb, but then something else happens. There's a belief and self-talk that's actually happening. So A, B, then C. So activating events either activate or they trigger us. Then it's really about what we tell ourselves that cause us to feel a certain way and behave. Now remember the brain, let me back up here. Brain science has actually told us that your amygdala fires first. So your emotional center fires first and then it takes a little bit of time for your frontal lobe and your prefrontal cortex to catch up. So that's typically why we get confused or why we can um, identify perhaps the emotion first. Mm -hmm. Then we have the thoughts that continue to either make us feel more angry or can help us to reduce some of those feelings. Okay, so looking at this example, you are criticized by your boss, so that's a trigger point. We have two ways to look at this, irrational beliefs or rational. So an example of irrational, he has no right to talk to me this way and I can't stand it. Okay, so then the cause might be feeling a little more anxious, depressed, or, or angry about that. Or we can slow down, recognize that that upset us, and have a more rational belief. I don't like the way he's talking to me, but I can stand it. Okay, then there's a lack of significant emotional distress and only mild annoyance. So are you still frustrated at this point? Right, okay, so this formula is what we do in therapy to assist and what you can learn to do and at home to help you reduce some of those negative emotions. So in cognitive behavioral therapy, we're not teaching people to think life is perfect and to just, um, just be like Pollyanna and like nothing's wrong. Does that make sense? We just want to, you might still have negative emotions involved, but we, um, but we want to reduce that annoying, to down. Does that make sense? We want to reduce the negative emotion. I'm still holding this and I just need to pull up this quote. Okay, so this 
This is a quote from another author, a God-inspired author called Ellen G. White. It says, success or failure in this life depends much upon the manner in which the thoughts are disciplined. If they are controlled as God directs that they shall be, they will be upon those subjects which will lead to greater devotion. If the thoughts are right, the words will be right. Okay. Where is that? Oh, sorry. That's from uh, Reflecting Christ, page 163.6. Okay, so what is self-talk? So self-talk is essentially what we tell ourselves in our thoughts. Okay, it's a running dialogue that's occurring all the time. Our thoughts happen so quickly in milliseconds that sometimes we can't even catch what we're telling ourselves. But it's specifically the words we tell ourselves about people, ourselves, experiences, life in general, the future, the past, and the present. It can also be images. Sometimes it's not a complete sentence and it can be just a feeling that you have. Um, but our self-talk is important. get that. Um, so I want to now talk a little bit about irrational self-talk and give you some examples of what we do in our daily life because once we can recognize, the first step is recognition and awareness to make a change and then you practice doing something different about it. Okay and some of this might seem really common sense to us but it's amazing how we can get stuck with this type of um, irrational thoughts. Okay. So shoulds and musts, we're going to talk about absolutes. So just looking at this, we can have I absolutely should or must, you, he, she absolutely should, must, and the world and the conditions under which I live absolutely should or must. Now, anybody just reading these, what could potentially be the danger of this type of thinking? Impossible to accomplish. It's impossible to accomplish, exactly. Okay, so if you run out of milk, should you go to the store to get more milk? Is that okay? Oh, I, I should go to the store and get more milk. Yes. Yeah, so sometimes in our language, it's appropriate to say should or must, but for the most part, we use these terms so loosely and we place high demands and such high expectations that we find ourselves getting worked up and frustrated yes. over those demands and expectations. And it's really not helpful. And if you're already struggling with depression or anxiety, it's not going to help reduce those, um, that difficulty that you're going through. So what should you say instead? I would like to, I prefer, or I wish. I hope to. I hope to, okay, <laughs> yeah. So it just takes away some of that, those heavy demands and expectations that you're placing on yourself or others. Okay, some irrational self-talk. This is coming from the book SOS for Your Emotions. The author puts these together. He calls them the five hot links. Um, and so condemnation and damnation. So this is when we're wishing punishment and ruin either on ourself um, or other people. And typically it results in a lot of anger directed to either yourself or others. Okay, so not helpful. Um, and a lot of people struggle with this one. And it could be as simple as, oh, I'm so stupid. I can't believe I did that. That was so dumb of me. It could appear really um, harmless. And it's, it's affecting you because remember, what we tell ourselves and our thoughts influence and impact our emotions, which therefore determines how we behave and how we treat people. Okay? I can't stand it, itis. Um, this is where we say, and I have uh, trouble with this one. I can't stand it, right? I, I come from a very emotional family, and um, so this one and, and the awfulizing is something I have to watch out for in my daily language. So I can't stand any discomfort, anxiety, anger, or depression. Um, I can't survive or be happy at all if I have to endure these feelings. Truth is, is what is the only thing you cannot stand in this life? What can you possibly not stand? It's kind of a trick question. Death. Death. Did, did you say that? Yeah. Great, yeah, death. 
that, that's the only thing. So we do have hardships and some extremely horrible things happen to people um, that, that we don't deserve. But living in this world, things do happen. And um, in our language, we can either har harm ourselves by saying this, um, or we can say oh, we don't like it, but we can stand it. We what can about get through. <clears throat> betrayal. Betrayal. I'm sorry, what do you mean by betrayal that? Betrayal is something I can't stand. Yes, okay. Yeah, so betrayal. But can you survive betrayal? It depends. Yeah. It really depends on the circumstances. It's true. And I do want to say that, um, well, as we go through these, a couple of maybe some people will be thinking well there's some relationships that are extremely harmful like abuse and that really you need to be working with a professional who can help you sort through your thoughts because um, we're gonna get I'm not quite sure what it is but there's another part of the presentation that you'll be thinking oh wow um, you do have to set some healthy boundaries in your life um, and that's okay to do but for the most part I think even with, for example, be betrayal, you can say, this is really hard for me, and I don't like it. I was just, but, I was just making a generalized statement. Right, yeah. right. But saying that, you so definitely, again, with cognitive behavioral therapy, and as you practice this, you can admit that it's extremely, you need to tell yourself truthful, logical thoughts, and they have to be accurate. So you can admit, this is one of the hardest things. I'm having a hard time forgiving that person. Um, this is really difficult for me, but I can stand it. I can get through this. This doesn't determine who I am as a person. Okay, but good point. And then awfulizing. So again, we do this a lot. Oh, it was so horrible. It was terrible. It was the worst thing that happened to me. And um, Really, we can just tone down our language and say, well, it wasn't horrible. I, I didn't appreciate that happen to, happening to me. I didn't, I didn't like it, but... Um, Is that a drama queen? Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> drama. Like like, it. Yeah, exactly. I want to hire the EPs today. <laughs> and catastrophizing, you can do this with the future, too. It doesn't have to be your past or your present. You can catastrophize something in the future thinking, oh, man, um, I'm, uh, I'm trying to think of an example, but making the worst out of something that hasn't yet even happened or may not happen. Okay, so watch out for that. Um, I'm worthless. So people who are depressed really struggle with this one. I'm no good at all. There's a low self-acceptance. Um, just putting yourself down again. Oh, I'm so dumb. Um, I can't believe I did that. I'm, I'm not good enough. Um, thoughts like that. And then absolute language. This is another example of what we can say always and never. So he, she, or the situation will always be this way and will never change. Oh, he'll never change. Right? Now, based on the person's patterns and what they've shown you in, in the relationship, you might feel that way. But is it accurate to say that? No. Okay. Exactly. Yes. Ask yes. Question ask of, question. I can't stand it. You said that that you used the, the example of death. Um, and I've watched many people deal with you know their loved one's death over the years, and I've heard that and say that mm -hmm. frequently. I just won't be able to stand it when she dies, or mm -hmm. you know, is it all right to? Okay. So this book. Yeah. This book has a really good example in it. Um, I like this book because there's, um, it's more of a novel. It's easy to read versus SOS, Help for Your Emotions, is more of the textbook sort of thing. But they talk about that, how you need to be careful with your language. And actually, since reading this book, I've tried to watch out for my thoughts, too. Like, I can't imagine if, so you could say that instead, I can't imagine losing my husband. That would be one of the most difficult things I would have to go through. But it wouldn't, it would do me a disservice to say, I wouldn't be able to live if my husband died, or I wouldn't be able to stand it if he died. We have to be careful. We can admit how awful and hard that would be, but at the same time, 
what you're telling yourself, is that going to help you get through that difficult time? Or would it enhance more of suicidal ideation, essentially? Right? Thinking, oh, I wouldn't be able to live. I don't know what I'd do without you. I, that part, I think, is okay to say. I don't know what I would do without you. Because you don't know. <laughs> but saying that you wouldn't be able to live, that wouldn't enhance your depressive feelings. Yeah. What about the impression you might you wouldn't be able to survive your own death? That's, yeah. yeah, that's what, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, can't, I can't stand death. I can't. Right. Stand so, through your own, when you're dead, you can't survive it. Exactly. So that was the, that's a great question though, Lorene, but um, what I was asking was, what's the only thing you can't stand? So when people say, oh, I can't stand it when he talks to me that way. So typically, you can catch yourself with that type of hot language by saying, well, wait, I can stand it because I'd be able to survive it. The only thing we can't stand is death itself. So my, my death. It's just a clever way of trying to kick you out of that line of thinking. And truly, you can't stand. Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> you can't stand it because you're dead. Exactly. So I'm going to skip over these misbeliefs. Okay. So, uh, oh, man, time is going so fast. Ten cognitive distortions. So this is... The most important thing in cognitive behavioral therapy is helping people see their twisted thinking and they fall into 10 categories. And this is going to seem a little bit difficult. You have the um, descriptions on your paper, but it'll be most helpful if I use an example. This is one that the author in SOS uses in his book. Um, he talks about this girl who's a freshman in college and she needs to pass her speech class. But she's extremely nervous because the last time she did a speech she made a mistake and she's scheduled to present again tomorrow. Um, so she's feeling really anxious about this. And we're going to go through the 10 distortions to show you how she might be thinking about this. So the first cognitive distortion is all or nothing thinking. So this typically is black or white thinking. There's no gray zone at all. So if I don't do well in my speech tomorrow, I will be a failure. She might really be thinking that way. And that's not going to help her anxiety or her depression if she's struggling with that as well. Okay, overgeneralization. And this one happens when you take one event and you apply it to all similar events that will potentially happen to you. So she might be saying, last week when I gave a speech, I was missing a page. I got so flustered, couldn't finish it, so now I know I'll mess up again. So she's taking that last experience and now relating it to something similar and really getting herself worked up over that. That's another cognitive distortion. The third one is a negative mental filter. And this one is almost as if you put on a pair of glasses and when you're looking out of these glasses, all you can see are the negatives. Anybody know somebody like that, that just tends to just see the negative in everything? Um, you can't say negative. everything, but what was that? They don't call it negative, they call it realistic. Realistic, <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm glad you brought that up. So they tend to call it realistic thinking. Oh, I'm just a realist. Or just yeah. be positive about being negative. Right, positive being about negative. Okay, so this negative mental filter, now she might be relating it to any time she's going to be speaking in front of people, right? So I'm always messing up at school. She might just be looking for all the scenarios that she has messed up. Disqualifying positive examples. So even if somebody gives a person who's struggling with this distortion a compliment, they might negate it right away. Okay, so my teacher says I'm doing well, but not really, she just feels bad for me. Okay, see how that one can, can work too. Just say thank you. Sometimes if somebody is giving you a compliment, just say thank you. Don't complain about how it's too dry or how you know it burned a little bit on the edges. Just say thank you. Okay, and then mind reading. This one's tricky. I notice a lot um, of the adolescent population struggle with this one. Mind reading is basically what it says. We have, and it comes from insecurity. So we have a fear or something that we're feeling insecure about. Then we assume we know what the other person is thinking because we're afraid. 
essentially. So we jump to conclusion um, and, and think we know what's happening for them, okay? Um, so during the speech, you might see some people whispering and think, oh, they're making fun of me. And that we see this a lot with um, teens, especially. Is this making sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Number six, magnifying negative examples or minimizing positive. This one's a little bit tricky because it can go both ways. Dr. Nedley calls this majoring in minors and minoring in majors, okay? So let's look at her example first. She might be magnifying the fact that she, magnifying the negative. So I can't believe I was missing that paper. And then she's just dwelling on how awful that was and how dumb she was, okay? But we could also magnify positive qualities of ourselves. So someone that has an inflated self-esteem or an, a pride might magnify how good they are, okay? And then minimizing the positive could be, we, we already kind of talked about that one, that one's similar to disqualifying positive examples. So minimizing the positive, oh, I didn't really do that good of a job. Or you might minimize something negative, like a, a person who's in an abusive situation might be minimizing a greater issue, which is I'm being mistreated or I'm being abused. So it kind of goes back and forth. Lots of distortions that can come out of that. Number seven is emotional reasoning overrules logic. So this is where you let your emotions tell you what to do. So she has a bad feeling about tomorrow, maybe I should just call in sick, maybe I just won't even go, okay? And this one's really tricky. Um, and again, it's where we need to be focused on uh, enhancing our frontal lobe, um, and if you are more, if you're interested in that, I encourage you to take a look at this book by Dr. Nedley, The Lost Art of Thinking, about how to improve your emotional intelligence. Because we often get caught up in this and how we feel, therefore, determines how things are. And that's not the case. That's another distortion. We already looked at shoulds and musts. So I should be a better speaker. If not, it'd be awful. I must be a better student. Placing those heavy demands and expectations on yourself, again, is not going to help her anxiety. Negative labeling is similar to what we talked about in the hot links, the condemnation and damnation. Okay, I'm such a failure, I'll never be good enough. And then blaming oneself or others is another example of a cognitive distortion. Messing up last time was all my fault. Okay, so now when we're in relationships with people, it's really important for us to take ownership of what we're responsible for and to take ownership of our thoughts and emotions and our behaviors. But to give the blame all on somebody else is not going to be helpful. Um, or giving all the blame to yourself. Some people are in manipulative situations and you can be manipulated into thinking it was all your fault and that's not helpful either. Okay, so now how do we know, we've talked about irrational self-talk, we've talked about cognitive distortions, the 10 common ones. Now how do we know what is rational? What is an accurate way of thinking? And there are some um, characteristics that we're going to talk about now. So to have rational beliefs, your thoughts have to be logical. They have to be reasonable, sensible. Um, they need to be reality-based, so based on actual evidence and observation. So can you think of a time, like Maria, I'm sure she really, she might need help depending on how depressed and anxious she is. She might need help from her therapist to think about a time when she was up front or when she was speaking in a group that she actually did well, that she, she was okay. Um, so you can look for evidence and observation. And when we're working with people in relationships and we're doing that mind reading and we think we know what the other person is saying, part of emotional intelligence is checking in. I call it checking in. Just checking in with that person and saying, hey, it seems like, you know, you're treating me this way. It seems like you might be upset about this. What's going on for you? Just ask them what's going on. That's going to give you some actual evidence so you're not up in your head, 
assuming and jumping to conclusions about what's going on. So get your actual evidence, that's okay. Are your thoughts useful? Are they helpful and practical in attaining your goals? And then, are your thoughts enhancing? Are they making you a better person? Are they making your relationships better? Um, that's another characteristic to know if your thoughts are accurate. Are they helpful for your emotions? So are they working to reduce your anxiety, um, anger, or depression? And then are they based on preferences and wishes rather than shoulds and musts? Remember that. And are they lacking the five hot links? That's on your paper that we talked about. So they won't have the absolute language, the I'm worthless language. There shouldn't be any of that in your rational self-talk. Does this make sense? This is a nice little formula and you guys have this on your handout. Okay, so going back to Maria really quickly, um, her activating event is the speech tomorrow. Okay, so we're going back to this formula. A activates or triggers. So this is the outside event that we don't necessarily have control over. She's in this class, she needs to pass, so she's gotta do what's expected of her in the class. So this event is triggering her to feel anxious, but that doesn't have, she can do a couple things in this belief area and self-talk, and here she's kind of getting herself worked up. Okay, I must do well, or I'll be humiliated and feel worthless. I can't stand everyone watching me so closely. Remember, so she can she really stand it if people are watching her? Yeah, she can. It's, un, it's extremely uncomfortable for her, but she can work with a therapist to kind of fight through this distortion. Um, why does school have to be so hard? I'll never be good at speaking up in front of people. Okay, so do you all see the distortions in there? That kind of language? Okay, so then the consequence, her heart is speeding up, her hands are starting to tremble, she's feeling sick. She might even have her teacher on speed dial ready to call in sick with cl from class. But now she, you don't have to stop here. So remember, in our brain, we might recognize the emotion or some of us, especially working with teens, we help teens figure out their consequence first. So the fact that her hands are starting to tremble, that's often a good place for us to stop and think, okay, let's talk about your thoughts and what, what are you telling yourself right now? So in D, we get to detect the irrational beliefs and dispute them. So okay, I'm demanding, this isn't helping me, me demanding that I must do well is causing me to feel anxious. Although I don't like it, I can stand others evaluating me. Besides, my teacher says I'm improving. And even though I don't totally believe that, I can at least trust that she thinks that, right? And then your effect, you have a new emotion. So she continues to tell herself, if my speech isn't great, I can live with it. And then she has a reduced, so she's still anxious. Remember, we can't just poof and our anxiety or our feelings of sadness are gone, but we're reducing the severity of it. And then she has an increase of self-acceptance, which is going to lead to a better performance overall. So a little um, song that we actually teach people at the, um, at the uh, depression recovery program, Dr. Nedley's program, it goes to this tune, um, Fair Jaca. Okay, if you all want to sing with me, it goes, I don't like it, I don't like it, it's okay, it's okay, I can stand it anyway, I can stand it anyway, I'm alright, I'm alright. So I can't tell you how many uncomfortable situations this has gotten me through, and I'm trying to teach my daughter, uh, my kids, I want to teach them this as well. It's a nice little ditty that you can um, say to yourself and it really can help lift your mood, lift some of that anxiety as well. My quotes here. So, lastly, um, I want to reference again Ellen G. White in this quote here. So, in struggling with anxiety and depression, um, lots of people feel alone, and you're not alone. And um, there's been a lot of research that shows that having a spiritual life and a prayer life can help to reduce 
um, depression and anxiety. And um, I believe that there is a, a God that, who cares about all of us and who really um, is there by our, our side even in these challenging moments. And this quote is meant to encourage you. By steadfastly keeping the will on the Lord's side, you will bring every emotion into captivity to the will of Jesus. You will then find your feet on solid rock. It will take at times every particle of willpower that you possess, but it is God that is working for you, and you will come forth from the molding process a vessel unto honor. And that's again found in Reflecting Christ, page 294. Um, so you are not alone, and it does take practice. Um, we, we need to remember that, that even once working with some of these irrational thoughts and how to practice rational thinking, um, I'm a therapist and I struggle with a lot of distortions myself, and, um, but just remember you're not alone. And there, are, there is a way to find CBT therapists in your local area. This is on your handout. Um, it's on this website here. And uh, once you go on the website, you have to select, select your location. So you can put in Wenatchee. Um, and then on the left-hand column, you'll see a number of um, characteristics of therapy. And you can select CBT therapist. It will narrow your search and you can find local cognitive behavioral therapists in the area and you can um, further narrow your search to, in finding a Christian therapist as well. Um, I know this group came up under CBT therapist. There might have been one or two Christian therapists in this. Um, and then my information um, is on the handout. If you have any questions or need help finding a therapist in the area, I would be more than happy to assist people. I'm not practicing at this um, moment in time. And then there's Dr. Nudley's programs as well. Um, forgive me the slide.